Hello and welcome to Palm Sunday Worship at Shamrock Evangelical Methodist Church. This is Pastor Brian Wardlaw. I'm glad that you've decided to stop in today and, and uh, worship the Lord together with us. Before we get into our message this morning, our scripture lesson, let's have a word of prayer together as we get started. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to pause in the midst of our hectic, uh, crazy day and world and call upon you and worship you today. We thank you, we praise you, we bless your holy name today for all that you've done for us. And Father, we're grateful that today that we can call on your name and we can bring our cares and our burdens to you because you care for us. And I pray today, especially for that person who is maybe struggling physically, you know what they're going through. Some of them, Lord, have been to the doctor. Some of them have been uh, on medication and, and some of them, Lord, it just doesn't seem like there's, there's any answer to what they're going through. I ask that today that you would comfort them and bless them and help them, Lord, to find you to be their great physician. No doubt within, uh, within some, somebody's heart that is listening today is, is a person who uh, is struggling emotionally. They're listening to the news, they're reading the papers, they're paying attention to everything that's going on around about us and they're filled with fear and, and they're scared half to death. Not knowing who to believe, not knowing what to believe. And I ask today, Father, that you would strengthen that person who, who is just terrified in their spirit. It's just up and down. Help them, Lord, to see that you're the God of the day and God of the night. You're the God of the storm. You're the God of the calm. And we ask that you would strengthen them. We ask today, Father, that you would speak that peace to them that they need, for you are the Prince of Peace. No doubt, Father, there's somebody that's listening, that's watching uh, just now that is going through and facing some very uncertain days financially. I ask, Lord, that you would supply that need. I ask, Father, that somehow that you would make a way for there to be funds uh, available and fund sufficient for the need that they represent and that they have in their life today. Lord, we're glad that we can call on you. You are the God of all comfort, regardless of what we're facing, regardless of what we're going through. We're glad, Father, that we can trust you and that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. When all around our soul gives way, he alone is our hope and stay. For it's on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. And Father, as we study your word, I ask this today that, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, and help us, Lord, to receive some encouragement as well as some challenge from your word today that will help us to be better men and women, boys and girls, be better citizens and better uh, people because of your word. Father, I also today would pause just a moment to ask that you would give wisdom and direction to the leaders of our land. We ask, Lord, that you would bless our president and those that he has around him today that's guiding him and counseling him. I ask, Lord, that you would help all political agendas be laid aside and that you would help them, Father, to, to have one thing in mind and one purpose, and that is to see the good of the land and the good of the people. I ask, Lord, for our governor of our great state of North Carolina, that you would touch him today and that you would give him wisdom and those that are around him giving him counsel, Lord, I pray that you would give them strength and wisdom to do the right thing at this time. We pray for our city leaders all the way, Lord, uh, down to our local governments. We pray that you would give wisdom, give of your strength and help today. And Lord, I pray for your church, your people. Father, we realize that we're not able to gather like we have, are used to gathering, but uh, that doesn't hinder us from calling out upon you and trusting you. It doesn't keep us from worshiping you. And we pray, Father, that you would bless your people wherever they are today. May our hearts be drawn closer to you. And may, Father, in these days of difficulty, may we be strengthened in our resolve and our faith. And may we be more determined than ever today to walk in fellowship and communion with Jesus Christ and to find his blood to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We love you, Father. We ask that you would bless now as we look at your word. It's in Christ's name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. This morning I'd like to 
look to God's word in the book of Luke chapter 19 for our scripture lesson. I want to read Luke's account of uh, this triumphal entry. Beginning at verse 28. After he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. And he was going, as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd saw him, said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. When it, he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which made for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. This story is a story of great contrast, of rejoicing, shouting, praising, and also Jesus weeping, Jesus weeping. How long do you think it took the people to notice that Jesus was weeping? Do you suppose that they even noticed it all? Or do you suppose that maybe they were so caught up in all of the, the shouting and all of the potential that they saw in the king riding into Jerusalem to overthrow the Roman government? Do you suppose they even looked at it, looked at Jesus and recognized at all what it was that was going on? Do you suppose they even paid that kind of attention? As Jesus is riding in and he gets close enough, he can look over and rising over the crest of the hill and he looks down into Jerusalem, he begins to, to weep. I don't believe Jesus was weeping because of the cross. He wasn't weeping because of the beatings that he was going to take. He wasn't weeping because of the, the physical anguish that he was going to go through and going to encounter. No, no, no. He was weeping over the fate that would soon come upon the city and not only the city, but upon the whole nation. Instead of joyful shouts and praises, I believe Jesus heard the screams of terror. He, he heard the cries. He heard the groan of men and women as their suffering, as their little children were ripped out of their arms, as their homes that they had lived all of their life to provide for their family were destroyed and burned as they saw the temple destroyed and set ablaze. In his all-knowing mind, Jesus could see the devastation. He could see the death. And I believe that it caused Jesus to cry. He, Jesus began to weep because he saw that they would reject the gift of salvation. He saw that they would reject the crown of life that he came to offer and to provide for whoever that would believe. And as Jesus rides into the town on that afternoon, I believe he saw a lot of faces in the crowd. And that's this morning what I want to look at is the, the faces that Jesus saw as he looked at the congregation, as he looked out across the, 
the myriad of people and the faces that he could see around about him. And first of all, I'd like for us to notice the first face, well, not necessarily in order uh, of importance, but I, just for the sake this morning of this message, I believe that Jesus saw the face of his disciples. Have you ever looked into the face of somebody and said, I wonder what in the world is going through their mind? I know this more that today that if anybody if anybody's ever stood in front of a crowd and spoke or shared something in front of a crowd, they looked out around them and they had to it is it's crossed their mind. I'll guarantee it's crossed their mind. What's that one thinking? What's that one thinking? What's that one got going through? They don't have a they don't act like they they look like they don't have a clue in the world where they are or what's going on around about them. I wonder what she's thinking. I wonder what he's thinking. Fact is, I'm wondering what you're thinking right now. I've oftentimes looked into the face of a little baby and wondered and wished I could come up with and understand just what in the world is going through their mind, especially whenever we make faces. You know how we do. We make all kinds of crazy faces and crazy sounds and we do stupid things all just to get a giggle, get a little bit of a response. My little granddaughter, she's got the, the stare of a judge. If she doesn't make a judge, she doesn't make a poker player. I don't know of anybody that ever will. She'll look at you with the blankest look on her face. You would think that a you would think that you're looking at a stone wall with a painted face that looks just like Olivia. I wonder just what in the world is going through her mind. What in the world is she thinking? But how do you suppose Jesus felt when he looked into the face of his disciples? What do you suppose he was thinking as he looked at them and thought, what in the world? Do you suppose maybe that Jesus said, thought to himself, you know, these disciples, they are so caught up in this rock star moment, this rock star event but they're not even paying attention to what's going on. All the hooping and the holler and all of the excitement around about them, they're not paying any attention to what is really taking place. What do you suppose the disciples were thinking? Or do you suppose they were so caught up in the moment that, that they weren't really given any thought about tomorrow at all? Maybe they were thinking in their mind, Jesus, Jesus just told us that he was going to die. Jesus just told us that he that we were going to forsake him. And, and yet all of this, what in the world? Do you suppose they were thinking if all of these bad things Jesus predicted and just told us hours before were going to happen, we'd better enjoy all of this joy and happiness now. We may never get to experience it again. Maybe Jesus was weeping for the disciples because he knew what they were going to go through. See, Jesus is all knowing. He knows yesterday and tomorrow, and he knows the difference between tomorrow and yesterday. And I wonder if maybe Jesus wasn't looking at his disciples and, and he began to think about what they were going to have to go through because of their faith in him. Do you suppose that he saw James as he was led to the guillotine? Maybe he was thinking about Thomas as he saw him in his mind's eye. In his omniscience, he saw, he saw Thomas as he was being stoned. Maybe he saw John deserted on the Isle of Patmos. Maybe he saw Simon the Zealot as he was being sawn in two for his faith in Christ. Maybe in his mind he was looking and he was seeing Peter, wasn't it Peter, who was crucified upside down. His sentence of death was crucifixion, but he said, I am not worthy to be crucified as my Lord and Savior. So he asked, would you please crucify me upside down? And he hung upside down until he died. As Jesus looked at the face of his disciples, he wept. I believe there was another group, another crowd that Jesus saw and began to weep for. And I want to call this group the ruthless Pharisees. The ruthless Pharisees. 
Luke tells us that Jesus was surrounded with Pharisees. There were Pharisees that were all over, through, interspersed throughout the crowd. But I can guarantee you this, the Pharisees were not rejoicing. They were not celebrating Jesus. Can you imagine the anger that was seething deep inside of the soul of all of those Pharisees because Jesus was being worshiped. Jesus was being praised, but Jesus was their enemy. They saw Jesus as the one who was going to come and he was, and he th he was threatening them and their position. He was threatening their power. The one thing they feared the most was Jesus running them off and clearing the swamp. Luke tells us that somewhere along the, the Pharisees, uh, uh, along the parade route, that the Pharisees finally had about all they could take. Their heads were about to explode. I can just imagine. And it tells us here that they, they, the Pharisees in the crowd said to him in verse 39, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Teacher, tell your disciples to be quiet. We can't handle it anymore. Tell them to be quiet. But Jesus responded this way. I tell you, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Although the Pharisees were lost in their stubborn pride and refused to acknowledge Jesus Christ, he still wept over them, I believe. These people, the thing that caused Jesus, I believe, to weep over them so deeply was because of how religious they were, and yet their hearts were far from the Lord. They knew the law. They knew the requirements. They knew Moses frontwards and backwards. They knew the writings of the, of the, of, uh, the prophets. They knew the writings of, of uh, Moses. They knew all that stuff so well, and yet they totally missed. They totally missed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus weeps over the disciples. He re weeps over the ruthless Pharisees. But here's another group that I believe that Jesus wept over. And Jesus wept over the indifference of the Roman soldiers. The indifference of the Roman soldiers. You see, during the, during the feast of Passover, there were thousands of Roman troops that were brought in reinforcements if you please to keep the peace i mean the crap for crowd control okay so they brought all these uh they bring all of these extra roman soldiers in so they're standing on every street corner they're down shoulder i'm sure they're keeping their six foot social distance but they're they're interspersed all throughout the city to keep the peace if there was any uprising that took place they would they would quickly squelch it shut it down but I can assure you today that, <clears throat> that those thousands of people in that celebration or hundreds, however many they were, they weren't posing a threat to the Roman government. They weren't posing a threat. And I wonder if those, those soldiers, I wonder if those soldiers didn't look at them and say, those people aren't any trouble. They're not causing any riots. They're not causing difficulty. In fact is, <clears throat> they look like they're having a pretty good time. Let's just leave them alone. <clears throat> Tell you what, you guys stay in your little corner and we'll stay on our street corner and we'll just won't bother each other and we'll get along fine. And I wonder if, I don't wonder, I know. There's a lot of people like that yet even today who tell Jesus, Jesus, you, you do your thing and I'll let, let, let me do my thing. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. We'll get along fine. Lord, I won't bother you if you won't bother me. That kind of attitude caused Jesus to weep on that day, the feast of Passover as Jesus is riding in Jerusalem. And that same attitude causes Jesus to weep today the indifference of people's hearts. The last, uh, the next to the last group I want to think about in this lesson today, I'm going to call these people the fickle followers, not pickle followers, fickle followers. 
I wonder if this wasn't the largest group. Sure, they, they were all for Jesus now. But as I said earlier, Jesus knows the beginning from the end. He knows the future from the past. And he knew that in just a year, very few short hours that this group of people that were calling for his coronation would be calling for his crucifixion. And so I believe that Jesus was weeping for the fickle followers that were just following the crowd. They were just following the, the rest of the bunch. They were motivated by selfishness. They thought that Jesus was going to follow their plan. And so they were all about him. But Jesus knew their devotion was only temporary. He knew that those same voices that were crying out, praising him, rejoicing over his, his ascension, supposedly to the throne, would be the ones who were calling out for his crucifixion, his scourging, his beating, those that would walk by and, and, and at one moment were patting him on his back on the, in this event, just a few short hours and days later would be spitting in his face. Last but not least today is this crowd I want to think about that, that Jesus saw and it caused him to weep. That I believe is the crowd that includes you and me. I believe Jesus saw your face and he saw mine. As he looked down through time, he saw you and I. Now I know today that each one of us are made up different emotionally. But have you ever had one of those moments of pride and joy all at the same moment that just welled up inside of your heart until your eyes began to leak? I've had many times like that. I can think of three very prominent ones that I had in my life, and that's when our three children were born. I'll never forget the event of all three of them. The same event of birth, but so particular and so peculiar with each one of them. And I can very keenly remember even yet today, now several years later, watching and observing and hearing the cries of that little child and the pride and the joy that welled up inside of me until my eyes began to leak and run down my face. Yes, I was excited. Yes, I was rejoicing. I've had many times like that since. I've had many times of, uh, of, of weeping out of pride and weeping also out of concern for those same three children. Because I knew that they were making decisions and choices that would affect their life that would affect the lives of other people, that would affect their destiny. My concern was that they would make those right decisions. They would make the right choice. They would go the way that God would have them to go. I've cried out for joy, and, and I've cried out of concern many times, not just for my own family, but for my church family, people within my church, people within our congregation. I've spent many times weeping, and crying that God would have grace and strength and mercy on their lives. I believe today that Jesus, much the same way, weeps for you and I out of pride, yes, but also out of concern that you and I would choose the right way, that we would choose the path that leads to righteousness, that we would accept His Son, Jesus Christ, as our personal Lord and Savior. When Jesus scanned the crowd that day, I believe he looked all down through time and he sees you and I. And I wonder if, if, if those people could have been somehow magically grouped off into separate segments. I wonder which group you and I would have fallen into. Would we have fallen into the group of the ruthless Pharisees, choosing to accept the tr refusing to accept the truth and submit to his word, not liking what it is that Jesus had to say because it might cost us our position, our power, and our pride. Maybe he would have seen us in this group over here that were a part of the indifferent soldiers, having an attitude, Lord, I tell you what, let's strike a deal. You don't bother me, I won't bother you. 
Maybe he saw us in the middle of the fickle crowd praising him as long as everything was coming our direction, as long as the bills were paid, as long as the health was good, as long as the car was running, as long as the job was secure, as long as the retirement was growing. Or did he see us? Did he see us hanging our head out of shame? knowing that in a few hours we would reject him? Did he see us a part of that fickle crowd that just today on Good, on good Friday or today on, uh, on Palm Sunday were rejoicing, shouting, praising God, but by Friday were calling for his death? Jesus weeps for people like this. The thing is that you and I have the power we have the power to determine what Jesus sees when he looks at us. What does the Lord Jesus Christ see when he looks at you and when he looks at me? Trust me, the Lord does see us. We can't hide from him. We'll never be able to run from him. He knows exactly where we are. We can try, we can do this, we can do that. We can, we can run, we can blame somebody else. We can blame this one, we can blame that one. We can hide behind the other one. But Jesus knows, Jesus knows. Several times in the scriptures, we find Jesus encountering individuals, sometimes individuals, sometimes groups. But there's something that I love to, to read in those occasions. We find it more than one time that Jesus, when he saw them, he had compassion on them. And Jesus is looking on you and I today with compassion. It really doesn't matter this morning. It doesn't matter how messed up your life may have become. It doesn't matter how you've made bad choice after bad choice and you've chased bad money with worse money. It doesn't matter how many times you have fallen flat on your face and rejected him. It doesn't matter how many times you've made promises and reneged on every one of them. Jesus still looks on you with compassion because he loves you regardless. He loves you regardless. The question this morning is, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him right now? He's looking for you to repent of your sins. He's looking for you to accept him as Lord and Savior of your life. He has already, he died on that cross. He shed his blood for our forgiveness of sins. But you and I cannot enjoy the benefits of that redemption, of that crucifixion, of that resurrection, unless we come to him and repent of our sins and confess those sins and allow Jesus Christ to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you know him as your Lord and Savior today? If you don't, I'd encourage you to do as the scripture tells us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The good news today is the fact that if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you will confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. We read in the scriptures, there's coming a day when the Lord is going to come and we're all going to stand before Jesus. And the scripture tells us that he's going to separate the goats and the sheep. There's going to be those that are among the goats that are going to say, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We did this in your name. We did that in your name. We did all of these things in your name. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me. There's going to be those in the other crowd that say, Lord, we didn't know that you were ever in that kind of condition. We didn't know that, that you were hungry. We didn't know that you were destitute. We didn't know that you were thirsty. We didn't know that you didn't have sufficient clothing. We just gave because we saw a need and you had blessed us and so we gave to others. Jesus is going to say, in as much as you had did it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me well done enter thou into the joys of your lord forever there's coming a day of separation but today there's still hope 
there's still hope. Yes, it may seem difficult and it looks difficult all around us and it is difficult. But Jesus looks upon us with compassion and he weeps. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior, would you just bow your head and pray with me? Gracious Father, we thank you today for your love and that you look upon us with compassion. We confess today, Lord, that there's been too many times in which we've been part of that self-righteous crowd. We've been part of that congregation that said, that, Lord, if you'll just do your thing, I'll do my thing. You, you mind your business, I'll mind mine. We'll go our separate ways. But Father, we're so glad today that you look upon us with compassion and that you weep. You weep. Your word tells us that you, you're, you're, not, you're not slack, you're not lax in concerning your promise, but you're not willing that any should perish, but that you want all to come to repentance. And Father, if there's somebody today who is watching this, and they do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I ask, Father, that they would just in their heart and that right now where they are, that they would see, say these, these words. Father in heaven, I confess my sins. I repent of each one of them. And I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sin. Come into my heart and make me a new creature in Christ Jesus. I confess you as Lord. I believe in my heart. In the first opportunity, I'm going to give confession with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And on authority of God's word, I believe I am saved. Father, I thank you today that there is somebody who made that prayer, somebody who has made that confession of faith. And I ask, Lord, that you would help them to, to, that they might realize and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the blood of Jesus Christ has washed them clean on authority of your word. I ask, Lord, that you would go with us throughout this day and throughout the days that lie before us. Keep us safe. We pray a special wall of protection of health around, upon, around your people today, each and every one of them, Lord. And those that are struggling with this virus, we pray for healing. I pray, Father, for restoration of health and those that are working feverishly to come up with a vaccine, come up with some kind of a, of a, of a drug that will help us to be protected or healed from this awful virus. We pray, Lord, the knowledge and help it to be expeditiously brought to our shells so that we could take it and be spared. Lord, I pray that you would go with us today. In all that we say and do, we want to honor and glorify your precious name. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray and ask it all today. Amen and amen.